Today I want to use one verse to stir your faith. Just one verse to stir your faith. How many of you all need your faith stirred today? One verse that's going to stir your faith. And what I'm getting ready to tell you, this is good for you. This is good for your children. This is good for your children's children. So we're going to send this blessing backwards. Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, he says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. For it is he who gives us the ideas, the wisdom to create wealth. I almost called this sermon a million dollar idea. Because God is about to wake you up in the middle of the night. Let me, let me rephrase that. Some of y'all woke, you, you woke now, but you ain't woke. God about to wake you up while you woke. And some idea to change the trajectory of your life is going to hit you. It's happening to me right now. I got something I'm working on every time I look. See, when you focus on something, you will start to see it's already all around you. You are ignoring the signs because you haven't zeroed in on your vision. I promise you, the moment you zero in on your vision, everything is going to start to speak to you. I promise you, this is the truth. Every clue you need, you know how you've been struggling to name the business. Once you figure out what it's going to be, all of a sudden the name is going to pop up. Because God's going to give you the ideas to create wealth. And when you get there, it's going to be stupid crazy. Like... You're going to have so much, you're not going to really know what to do. This is going to be the first time in your life you have so much money you've been scared. <laughs> you're going to have so much peace, you're going to be afraid. See, this is what the devil's going to trick. Your life is going to go so good that you're going to be tiptoeing around trying to figure out when it's going to fall apart. And I came to tell you, it's not. This is what God told me to tell you. After we finish this message, you're going to be so blessed, you're going to ask yourself the question, which is why I named this sermon, How Did I Get Here? How did I get here? I want you all to just, somebody just prophesy to your purse and say, how did we get here? Just, just speak to it. Speak to your wallet, speak to your pocket, speak to your heart, speak to your mind. How did I get this peaceful? How did I get this happy? How did I get this tranquil? How did I get here? I was just depressed six weeks ago. How did I get here? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So the book of Deuteronomy is written by Moses. And Deuteronomy is, according to some theologians, his farewell speech before he dies. Um, some refer to Moses as the escape artist. If you look at his life, he's always getting out of something. He was born to a mother who couldn't nurse him because Pharaoh wanted him dead. She puts him in the water. Pharaoh's daughter gets him out of the water and raises him in the house. Escape artist. Escape artist. He's, he's always getting out of trouble. And he writes Deuteronomy as his farewell speech. And, and God gives him the brush. And Deuteronomy is what he paints. And, and as we look at this, one theologian says that this, this, this text, this, this chapter, should actually be called, uh, it's called Deuteronomy, but one, one author said it should be called 
as I really am. Okay. Hmm. And he goes on to say in this book, he says, the reason why we should call this book as I really am is because when Moses paints the picture of Israel on the tapestry of Deuteronomy, he does it with all of the pimples and all of the freckles and all of the crows free and all of the impurities because you cannot give an actual portrait and leave out the blemishes. And he goes on to say the reason why Deuteronomy wouldn't work in 2023 is because most people never post pictures of how they really look. Come on, y'all, talk to me. When, when my wife and I were on the way to Africa, there was a lady sitting in front of me. When I tell you she took at least 37 selfies of herself, and I thought to myself, I said, now, it's you. It ain't going to change. I, I don't care. I mean, come on, how many of y'all ever seen? They go, it's... it's i like, why does it take you so long to find your angle? You've been with you all day long. You should know your angle. She, she's, she's snapping and snapping, and then the picture she took, she put it in an app to retouch it because most of us don't want images of ourselves out there that haven't been retouched. Which is why God allowed Moses to write the story about Israel because the photographer... His job is to capture you in the best image. Yeah. Yeah. But as he presents this to God, he says, for the first time, I can't cover up the blemishes because when you get where you're going, I need you to remember where you came from. Come on, come on, Pastor. Come on, Pastor. And how many people in here are always trying to erase the parts of your past that you don't want anybody to remember. You sanitize and bleach where you are without letting anybody know where you came from. But the most important thing about you is not where you ended up. It's where you came from. How many of y'all, if you look over your life, you ought to be shocked that you made it this far. Come on. I mean, how many of y'all can think of at least two times where you almost went crazy, three times where you almost killed somebody, four times where you almost killed yourself? The beauty of your life is that you never gave up, that you never quit. And the truth is, you have seen people buckle under the same pressure that you carry. How many of y'all ever been through some hard stuff? I just want to know if I'm in the right place. Hard stuff. I don't care if you're 18 or 88. You've been through some hard things. But one of, and write this down if you don't hear anything else I say. One of the first steps towards maturity is accepting reality. I just, I'm going to say it again because that's the best I got today. One of the first steps towards maturity is accepting reality. If you cannot accept where you are, you don't deserve to go where you want to go. If I'm not good with money, I got to accept that. So then God can bless me with something to take care of. If I'm not good with patience, I've got to accept that. If I'm not good at tranquility, I've got to accept that. You know, some people recharge in noise. Some people recharge in stillness. Everybody's different, no matter what it is. And I'm not saying either is right or wrong, but I have to accept where I am. I have to accept who I am. I have to accept the way my mind works. I have to accept all of the trauma that brings me to the place that I'm at. So the first step towards maturity is not forgetting where I've been, it's accepting where I am and believing in the reality of where I am. Now there are three essential elements 
that were crucial to Israel's success and conquest of the promised land, which I believe, ladies and gentlemen, are the same three things that God is requiring from us today. Now, this is so important that it's gonna sound simple. It's so important that many of you all are gonna miss it because it doesn't rhyme, it doesn't have a whole lot of sexiness to it, it don't have a lot of flair, and you're gonna miss it because we are, we are tuned to be excited about one hit of quitters and, and those quotes that rhyme that everybody can use. But I'm telling you, what I am getting ready to give you are the three things that God asks from Israel. They are the same three, th uh, three things that he's asking from you and I today, and these three things will set you up to have the most successful Christian experience you could ever have. What I'm about to tell you will change your life. It is a lesson that is worth sitting your children down in a chair and saying, listen to mommy, listen to daddy. These are the three things that will change your life. It's worth putting as a screensaver on your phone. It's worth writing in marker on your mirror. It's worth putting on a notepad. It's worth reciting every day. And I'm afraid that when I give it to you, you'll be like, Tuh. it's simple. But it is what God told Israel, and it is what he told me to tell you today. He says, if you want to have a successful life, here are the three things you need to do. Read the word. Remember the word and respond to the word. I told you they weren't going to say that. I told you. That's it. That's it. Read the word, remember it, respond to it. There is nobody in the scripture that ever failed that heard the word, remembered the word, and responded to it. Because the one thing that God cannot ignore is what he said. If God says give 10% and he'll pour out a blessing on you, you don't have room enough to receive, he can't ignore that because he said it. God is actually obligated to obey himself. He cannot ask you to obey him and him disobey himself. So if God said it, you can count on it. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you throughout this message. These are the three most important things that you can ever teach anybody in your life. It is not about, I'm telling you, you eat right, eat healthy, exercise, all of that is important. But before you get to taking care of the physical body, you've got to take care of the spiritual body. And let me tell you, reading the word, remembering the word, and responding to the word are the most three important elements in the entire universe. Are you here with me today? I'm going to prove it to you. The Bible says that God told Abraham, to take his only son, Isaac, to a mountain. What would have happened if, if, if Abraham had heard the word and remembered the word and not responded to it? He would have never taken Isaac up the mountain. Do you remember when uh, the Bible says that God says to Samuel, go to Jesse's house because I have taken my anointing from Saul, and now I want to anoint another king. What if Samuel would have said, God, I'm not, I'm not anointing today. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to, we would not have David. If we don't have David, we don't have Jesus. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. You remember Ananias? The Bible says that God says to him, he says, get up and go to Judas's house on Straight Street and ask him for a man named Saul. In fact, let's go back a little further. You remember there was a little boy named Samuel who was born to a woman named Hannah and they were in the house of Eli who was the priest over the house and the Bible says that God says Samuel and Samuel ignores him. He goes back to Eli and says, Eli, did you call me? Eli said, I hadn't opened my mouth. He went back and laid back down. Another voice said, Samuel. Samuel got back up and said, Eli, did you call me? Eli said, boy, I told you I'm asleep. Who, how can I call you and I'm asleep? He goes back to bed. The Bible says again, Samuel, he gets back up and goes to Eli. Eli says, if you come in here and ask me one more question, I'm going to knock you out. Samuel goes down and lays down. And then the Bible says the last time, Samuel, Samuel gets up and says, God, was that you? And God says, finally, Because 
You are going to respond to somebody's word. You just better make sure it's God's. You're going to have to obey somebody, even if it is yourself. There are somebody's words that you're going to hear. There are somebody's words that you're going to listen to, even if it's yourself. And God says, I need you to pay attention to my word. He says, I don't care what you hear on YouTube. I don't care what you see on TikTok. The only success that will come to your life will be a result of remembering and responding to my word. Nobody gets excited about the only thing that works. If I told you to get up, slap your neighbor three times, and it was a miracle going to fall out of the air, y'all be shouting all over this place. But let me ask you, where that miracle at? It comes as a result of being obedient to the word of God. Watch this. Four times between Deuteronomy chapter 8 and chapter 11, Moses says, remember the word. Another four times in the same four chapters, he says, don't forget the word. Okay? So when I preach this sermon today, when you listen to a message, you only remember about 5 to 10%. If you go back and watch it again on YouTube, you will increase that to about 20%. If you actually listen and write notes, you'll increase that to about 50%. And if you listen to it over and over and over again, you can actually increase that to about 70%. That's why David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart, that when stuff get hot, I can remember what you told me not to do. I'm paraphrasing. But reading the word, watch this, reading the word helps you with your reactions. It will. It will. It's, it's like, it's like if, I, if I give you a million dollars right now and the word says tithe and you read that over and over and over again, it'll, it'll, it'll be like I give you the money and then you, you might have a struggle, but you'll be like, man, 100,000. Man, you know what I can do with 100,000? You can do anything you want to do with it, but the word tells you what you should do with it. And the only thing God is obligated to listen to and obey is his word. Y'all woke church? Yeah. Somebody say obey the word. Say it again. Say obey the word. Now I'm getting ready to show you the four things that God does to test us to see if we are adhering to the word. Number one, here it is, first point, God test us. Everybody say, God test us. How many of you ever been tested by God? Hey, watch this. He says in Revelations 2 and 23, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. How many of you know God is searching right now? Searching your mind and your heart. Now, before you get scared, he ain't gonna tell nobody. Okay. And, and, and he already knows what he's looking for. Let me read it to you. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. How many people go around telling me, I got a good heart? Find it in the Bible. The Bible says in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. So here's the truth. There is no good people in this room. We're all bad people who do good things sometimes. No, I got Bible. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. There is none good under the sun. Let me ask you, anybody in here above the sun? So we are not good people. We are bad, sin-deprived people who do good things on occasion and some more often than others. But he says the heart is beyond Sure, listen, but he says, I have a plan for that. Now we're getting ready to preach. He says, in order to expose what's in the heart, me and the devil are going to have a tag team against you. I'm going to test you and the devil's going to tempt you. Come on, come on, come on. See, I, I want y'all to understand for everybody who came to be entertained today, this is a Bible believing church. We teach the Bible. I am not an artist. I don't entertain. I preach the word of God. Okay. Now, I can't do what Johnny says. I can do all that, but we're going to do that later. 
Okay. All right. So, so somebody say test, tempt. The devil tempts, but God tests. James says that God will never tempt us because there is no evil in him. Come on. I need a Bible believing church today. Now, why is this important? Because whenever you are tempted, the word temptation means that I am giving you a set of circumstances with the intent of knowing you will fail. A test says, I'm going to test you and give you the opportunity to make the right decision. So the devil tempts us with things that he knows we can't resist. And anytime something comes up in your life that's not good for you, that you struggle to get away from, that ain't God. That came from the devil because he wants you to fall on purpose. So he can accuse God of your mistake. Now, now, for everybody here who's a real G and ain't, ain't, ain't fake in church today, you know that there's something in your life that if it come up, I don't care how many tongues you speak in, it's on. Come on now, come on. I'll let you boy. I mean, every one of y'all got something. Okay, all right. Do me a favor, because I can't crack some of these soldiers in here. Look at your neighbor and say, ain't no future in your front. I don't know why you sitting up in here acting like you ain't got something that if it came in here right now, you will forget everything that's going on. If, if, if Calvin come in here right now, and it ain't always a person, sometimes it's a substance. And you know it's a temptation and a substance because you always make excuses for it. God know my heart. He knows my heart. Somebody say temptation. Most of us live on Temptation Island. The devil always tempting and tempting. And God says, I'm never going to tempt you. I'm going to test you on the knowledge that you have. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to succeed. And if you don't, I'm going to cover you by grace. And then I'm going to give you the test again as if you haven't taken it. And I ain't going to let nobody know what you did. I'm going to cover you in my secret place. And then I'm going to test you again. And I'll continue to test you until you pass. Anybody glad he's a mighty good teacher? God says, I'm going to test you, but I'm never going to tempt you. Why? Because there is no evil in my heart. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13, when he was teaching us about love, remember he says in chapter 10, he says, there hath no temptation, which is common to man. And God will always provide a way of, which means a way of escape, which means that God, this is how good he is. Whenever the devil builds a temptation around you that he knows is going to trap you because God is the master engineer, he tells the devil, I will not okay your plans if you don't put any exits in it. You missed what I just said. You missed what I just said. Can I say it again? Let me use Job for a moment. Jesus, God says to Satan, he says, have you considered my servant Job, which means that most of you all have been volunteered by God for the struggle you're in. God looked at every one of y'all said, have you considered Alvin? Have you considered Calvin? Have you considered Ed? Have you considered Johnny? Have you considered Sarah? Have you considered? He called you by name. And then the devil said, Oh, that's a good idea. I, I would, but you done put a hedge of protection around him. The devil says, if, if you move that hedge, I believe I can get to him. God says, all right, hedge removed. Go, go do your thing. He says, oh, by the way, you can touch everything, but on the person. Y'all don't read no Bible. He says, on the person himself, you can't lay your 
hand. He says, yeah. He says, watch, watch, watch. I make him curse you. And if he curses you, you got to kill him. God says, all right, let's go. Lost 10 kids. 10. All of his children died. All of his cattle. He was the richest man in the east. All of his money. His wife turned on him and said, you ought to curse your God and die. His friends walked out on him and Job stood in the midst of all of that temptation knowing that there was an escape. And he says, don't you slay me. <laughs> Yet will I trust you. Can I get somebody to high-five somebody and tell them, though he slay me, though I'm broke, though I'm sick, though I'm lonely, though I'm single, yet How many of y'all got the kind of praise that says, no matter what, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me it is well. So God never tempts. Watch this. Woo, don't sit down. Don't sit down. Because those of y'all who's standing up, y'all ain't going to have no fake stand up in a minute. It's going to be a real stand up. You know why God doesn't tempt? It's because temptation and love cannot come from the same source. Look at me. Look at your pastor. Record this, because I know they're going to put it out there. And I'm going to say it again. Anybody who sets you up to fail and to expose you can't love you. You heard what I said. And before I take it back, all right. Anybody who exposes you, who did the dirt with you, and then wants to expose you like you did it and they were absent. People who love you can test you, but anybody who sets you up to fail cannot love you. I got more Bible. Who need more Bible? Okay. What does the Bible say? Love. Love covers a multitude of sin, which means if I love you, I'll cover your nasty, naked, dirty, trifling butt. That's why God says, I love you and I'll throw your sins into the sea of forgiveness because one of the marks of true love is amnesia. You can't love me. No, no. I will prove it to you in the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says, love keeps no record. You can't be up here tabulating me and you love me. So love is actually defined professional forgiver. How many of y'all have been married 30, 40, 50 years? Raise your hand. Right here, baby. Oh, Jesus. In the face. <laughs> what is wrong with my mind, baby? Um, they ain't been married. Tell me here. They ain't been married 30. How long y'all been married? 39 years. 40 years. 40 years, you don't think they had to forgive? Ain't nobody walking in a tulip skipping for 40 years. Let me just take this back because they don't understand 40 years. 40 days. <laughs> Some of y'all be on Facebook on the first time about I'm in love. By December 3rd, you're talking about God just changed my destiny and this is the season for me to get rid of all fake people. That means they broke up. That's what it means. It, it, <laughs> It means that their relationship didn't last and they're going to put it on God and say they had a spiritual accountability. 
how do I know this because I've done this? <laughs> love covers. And here's what the Bible says, and love never fails. Here's my favorite quote. Any love that fails to finish had a flaw from the first. Because love never fails. So if you can fall out of love, it means you never climbed in it. And you can call it anything. Lust, um, obsession, financial security. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want, but it wasn't love. And, and, and that's why we are in so much pain is because we'll sell our hearts for things short of love. You sold your heart for a good feeling. You sold your heart so you didn't have to pay for dinner by yourself no more. You sold your heart so you can keep up with somebody on the internet and say, I got somebody too. You sold your heart for a social media status? But we're going to get there today. God says, it's okay. We're going to paint this picture. We're going to put the freckles on it. We're going to, because before you can say, how did I get here and appreciate being here, you're going to have to say, how did I get there? How did I ever get to the place where I stopped trusting? When, 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 because see, my mama raised me right. When did I, when did I start holding grudges like this? I, I went to Sunday school. I was taught to turn the other cheek, but. When, when did I get to the point where I just wanted to steal on people for no reason at all? When did I get to the point where I came to church and couldn't feel God? And as flawed as I am, how did I get so judgmental? Why am I so angry and bitter? When did I stop believing? And anybody there? Come on, I don't, I, I, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm, I'm really saying we're, we're, I'm Peter, I'm in the boat with you. I'm not, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just, I'm just asking myself the question because the first step of maturity is accepting reality. I'm, when did I get to the point where my temper got this short? I wasn't, wasn't always like this. And I can't blame anybody because that's what we all do. You made me get here. No. No, it's like this. I can't blame anybody. It's like if, if I came down and made you angry right now and then I turn around and said, I'm sorry and then tried to make you happy, you would stay angry. So how can I be responsible for your sadness when you won't allow me to be responsible for your gladness? Think about it. Think about it. If, if I make you mad, then I should be able to make you happy. You have to accept that you came that way. No, y'all not listening to me. I want you to think about this. If you got a smile on your face and I come and punch you in your stomach and you go down and you hate me forever and say, I made you mad, then I should be able to come massage your shoulders and you ought to be able to smile and I'll make you glad. But I can't do that because you chose to be mad and you refuse to be glad because happiness is an inside job and you are responsible for how you feel in spite of the temptation. And ain't no sense of you judging nobody here because everybody here don't have the same temptation. 
Am I right about that? Like you can, you can, you can sit a ton of cocaine right here on this altar. I ain't looking at it because I don't do it. That ain't, that ain't, you can't tempt me with something I don't want. You can bring, you can bring any, I ain't going to start telling you what you can bring up here, but I'm just telling you, you can bring a whole lot of stuff up here that I'm going <laughs> to. My boy said, but if it's Tito's, Doc, we in there. You bring some Casamigos up here. And did, oh, did I, I don't know. Why did you make me say that? You can bring a whole lot of stuff up here, it won't bother me, but the devil knows how to get me. The devil knows how to get you, which means that all of your temptations are tailor-made for you specifically, and nobody else can fit them. How does the devil know what to bring you? Because you keep saying it out loud. Remember, God is omniscient. He knows everything. The, the devil isn't. Listen to me. Everything the devil knows about you, you taught him. Everything the devil knows about you, you taught him by what you said out loud, by how you responded to the circumstance. That's why the Bible says, be still and know that I'm God, because the devil doesn't understand anything that isn't spoken. Can I give you some advice? Y'all gonna get mad if I give it to you? Who oh, can I give it to? Just raise your hand if you want the advice. You wanna learn, you want me to show you how to keep the devil out of your business? Shut up. I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to tell you to shut up, but shut up. First Peter 4 and 8. And above all things, have love among yourselves, for love covers the sins of multitudes. When you love, look at what God did for us. What, what, would, what would this be like if God flip somebody in here inside out and just start putting their life up here on this screen. I'm going to tell you right now, if the Lord come in here right now and start putting my life on this screen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to drive to Nebraska from here because nobody wants God to expose and he doesn't because he loves All right, here's my prayer for you. Here's my prayer for you. Y'all ready? Yeah. Ashley, Patrice, this is my prayer for you. Danielle, this is my prayer for you. Listen, Leslie, this is my prayer for you. Keisha, this is my prayer for you. Everybody hear me, because I'm about to tell you. The Lord told me this, and I wrote it down, and I put it in red in my notes. God says, my prayer is that God will remove from your life without consequence to you anyone who will intentionally cause you to fail. Oh! Oh! Good God. Oh! And the reason why you ain't, you don't know how many people plotting on you right now. I pray that God will remove in any way he decides anybody from your life that will try to contribute to your failure. So you can stop worrying about who's real and who isn't, and you can worry about your vision and your dream and your plan and the idea that he's about to give you because it is hard. It is hard to work on a good idea around people you can't trust. It's like, it's like when you almost get there, then you got to learn, look around and see if you with people who... It's exhausting. You know, and it's more exhausting when you give somebody all you have. And they won't give it back. Well, if you ain't going to help me, can you at least not try to hurt me? 
Like, if you don't like me, can you just go on and move on? But why stick around and try to drag me down and try to hurt my vision? I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for my mama. I'm doing it for my wife. I'm doing it for my children. Leave us alone. And I'm speaking to that jealous person on your job. And I'm telling you right now, y'all got some people at your job. They smiling and drinking Starbucks with you, but as soon as you walk out, now let me tell you, I wouldn't trust her because they just lying on you and talking about you. But what's gonna happen is they gonna get fired and you gonna look up and be sitting on the top floor with a corner office and wondering, how did I, how did I get here? I need somebody to praise God that you can see yourself in the future and start asking the question, how? Touch three people and say, how did I get here? 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 How did I get this blessed? How did I get this rich? How did I get this happy? How did I wake up one morning and didn't have diabetes anymore? How did I wake up and my blood pressure was normal? How did I wake up and the knee pain was gone? They had the knee surgery scheduled. How did I wake up with no migraines? How did I wake up with no lupus? How did I wake up with no cancer? How did I wake up with no anxiety? How did I wake up with no stress? How did I wake up with money I couldn't count? I promise you by the time I finish, I'm speaking here. There is a healing. I'm talking about a physical body healing that's coming over this house. See, every, well, I won't say everybody. Young people, you don't know nothing about this, but everybody in here, they got some age on them, they got a pain, they just learned how not to talk about it. I'm telling you right now, and I know you're 20 years old and you think you get up out of bed and you get to hopping, but people our age, we get a crook in our neck if we sneeze. Anybody ever had to go to a choo and you had to go to the hospital, your whole body just... <laughs> old people got to, when, when you get our age, you got to brace the sneeze. Choo, Ooh, I survived. Jesus, I survived. <laughs> Ooh, I survived another sneeze, Jesus. That's me communicating with our deaf minister. Y'all praise God for them over there. We love them. Love y'all. God teaches us. Now, y'all got, y'all got time. I, I got a revelation. How many of y'all ever heard when the, um, when the Bible talks about the manna falling from heaven? How many of y'all ever read that in the Bible where it says the children of Israel were in the wilderness and the water came out of the rock or he turned bitter water sweet? and manna came from the heavens. Who needs me to explain what manna is, by the way? Cool, I'm here for that. So manna was bread that literally just fell out of the sky. They were in the wilderness, the desert, so there is no wheat to turn into bread. You see what I'm saying, daughter? So there, there was nothing for them to do. So God knew there was no water. He would let water just come out of a rock. And manna would just fall out of the sky. Like that's literally walking and here comes some Wonder Bread. <laughs> right? Just, just bread just falling out of the sky. Here comes some baguettes. Just, just bread. And, and it will just come out of the sky. But watch this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our. Amen. So he never sent a loaf. He only sent a piece. Okay, um, let me see if I can explain this. Mimi has a little dog named Jackson. Jackson came in my room, stole the soul out of my shoe, and then ran in the living room. <laughs> and here I am chasing this little joke around my house. I don't know how he got in anyway. And I'm running around, and then I say, drop my thing. I get it back, and I take it back. And he, he come back in the room looking for something else to steal. You know why? Because dogs are animals of survival. 
instinctively he takes his portion and he goes because instinctively he knows that something else is going to try to take it from him. So the reason why God never gives us the loaf is because he knows that we'll take the loaf and hide from him. So God gives us enough bread not to be hungry for a little bit. So that way when you get hungry again, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as day. Give us our daily bread. Hungry again. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy So he gives you enough bread so you have to keep coming back because most of us can't be trusted with a loaf yet. It isn't that God doesn't have enough bread. It's that you don't have enough trust. And so he will let the manna fall from heaven. Now, I, I read this for the first time. I never knew. And this is why the Bible, listen, the Bible is a living document. Every time you go to it, you should learn something new. Sarge, the word, I used to think, I'm embarrassed to say this. I used to think that manna was like bread with no yeast in it. I thought it was a type of bread. I didn't realize manna. The word manna in the Hebrew means what is it? Which means that at first they were skeptical. What is, what is it? Until they found out that it was for them. And every day, what is it would fall down? And then the Lord told me that there are so many blessings that are getting ready to fall on you. You're going to be like, what is a billion? Because it's going to be something you've never seen before. He's going to pour out so many blessings, you're going to say, what is this? Where did it come from? And why is it so much? Yeah. 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 See, if you've never had it before, the first time you see it, you say, what is this? That means that God is about to bless you on a level you've never been. He is... He, is a, he, he will not give you any more of what you recognize. The next thing you get, you're going to say, what do you do when there are seven zeros on the check? I know this ain't for everybody. What are you going to do when you haven't had an argument in your house for a year? What, what are you going to do when your children just finally get on track and just like, and you start to see them find themselves and come on, I'm talking to somebody. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to get in where I fit in. What are you going to do? when you finally get the position that you've been praying for? What are you going to do when your business finally does open and you go from having a business to actually having customers and people start walking in the door and now you got to hire people to manage the surplus that God has sent you? What are you going to do? Because I'm telling you, that God is done blessing you on the level of your understanding. You're going to be like, what in the world is this? I got a piece that don't make no sense. What, what, is, what is this that makes me... Y'all ain't, y'all, y'all ain't, y'all too young. I, I can't, I, that's if I go there, y'all going to be lost. I already know. Something in me, I'll just give him a little bit, that, that holdeth the rain. Now, don't y'all forget this part about the church. There's something in me that banishes the, 
See, there was, there, that back in the day before they had artificial intelligence and before they had ATM machines and, well, ATM is ATM machine. I'm sorry, the last machine shouldn't be on there. But what they did before we have all of the stuff we have is rely on God. Before there was YouTube, we had a Bible. And you had to study to show yourself approved. God says, I'm, about, I'm just talking to you all online. I'm talking to you in this house. God told me, he says, I'm about to teach you. But this manna is not just for your stomach, it's for your spirit. Y'all remember when Jesus came to the, the, the wilderness and the Bible says that Satan came to tempt him? Right, right. And he says, if you are who you say you are, I think this is in Luke chapter 4, he says, and Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 in both chapters, he says, if you are who you say you are, he says, turn these stones into what? What did Jesus, now Jesus had the power to do that, you know that, right? But what did he say? Man should not live by bread alone, but what? But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then he backs it up in John and says, just in case anybody tries to take the bread from you, don't worry about it. I am the bread of life. And anybody who eats of this bread shall never hunger. And anybody who drinks of this water shall never thirst. God says, it is not important that you know what it is. What's most important is that you find out who it is. He is your source, not your job. Has God ever blessed anybody in here when work slowed down? Now, I'm just, I'm just looking for some real honest people. You don't make the money you used to make, but you're not hungry. You don't make the money you used to make, but you're not without clothes. You don't make the money you used to make, but you still have a vehicle to drive. And every time you worry about gas money, here come a blessing. You have to ask yourself, how did I get here? I don't have a degree. I don't have a, I don't have a master's. I don't have a bachelor's. I didn't graduate high school. How did I? Here, I went to school. I think they put me through because I'm not sure I passed. How did I? Okay, let me see if anybody be honest. Anybody here got a GD? Raise your hand. Look at all these blessed people in here. Amen. How many single mothers in here you had to raise all of them crumb snatchers by yourself? How many of them still here, still doing well, still loving God, still respectful, not in jail? Because every time you turn around, he keep blessing you. And I just, my last question, how many of y'all have ever said, I don't know how I'm gonna make it through this? And you are on the other side of the thing you said. I, I want to finish, but I got to tell you the last thing that happened. This is so important. How many years were there in the wilderness? My brother, the Bible says, now this is crazy. They walked in the wilderness for 40 years, and their clothes never wore out. How you wear shoes for 40 years? See, they didn't, they didn't come from Payless like our shoes. How many of y'all mama you take you to Payless and get you some pro wings? Y'all ain't had no pro wings. 
Oh, y'all in Texas were oil money. Y'all always had Nikes and Reeboks. None of y'all had no Stadius. You don't even know what I'm talking about. I remember one time my mama bought me some pro wings to play basketball in. And she didn't know that the bottom of them wasn't rubber, they were plastic. And I was playing basketball, and I ran down the court and tried to stop, and this is what happened. I slid right out the door and went, I slid all the way home. I just was at the front door. She was like, how do you get here? I said, I tried to cross somebody over. <laughs> we used to get our shoes at the grocery store with that, that string on them. You know how they come with that, that little bouncy string. Come on, y'all. Y'all so rich, all of y'all shoes came in boxes. I can't stand you Texans. Y'all always have money. I'm a new. I did not grow up like that. My mama took care of me. <laughs> Don't take me that. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> 40 years walking in the same shoes. Now, I don't know about you, but the foot takes a different turn in 40 years, don't it? If the shoe don't wear out, the foot do. You mean tell me 40 years ain't nobody got no bunions and 40 years ain't nobody got no corns? We can't switch shoes? Their clothes didn't wear out. I used to stop there and shout. I read it again this week, and the Lord showed me something else. The Bible says that he says to them, and I will keep from you every disease. Which means in 40 years, not only did their clothes not wear out, nobody needed a doctor. I speak in this house right now that your new wealth is going to be health. And you're about to get off of the medication. And God is about to give you 40 years of good health. If you believe that God is a rewarder, I want you to give him glory in this place today. Somebody shout, I rebuke sickness in my body. God says, I'm not even going to let you get sick in between where you are and where you're going. I don't know who that's for. Somebody shout, I'm healthy. And that's why I'm wealthy. You can have a whole lot of money, but if you don't have no health, I'm praying that God blesses you with health. I come up against migraines, come up against leukemia, come up against spinal disfigurations. I hear the Spirit talking about childhood diabetes. I, I come up against protein in your child's urine. I hear it in the spirit. I come up against all manner of diseases because as you are walking, you're going to need to be healthy. I'm asking God to literally pull pain out of your body right now. To the person who has that pain in the lower left side of your back, it used to hurt when you were walking, now it hurts when you sit. God is a master physician. I come up against knee pain. See, and we don't, we, we're not just talking about stuff that you're gonna die from. I just want to be able to wake up and not hurt. Moses said, okay, he can do all of that, but here's what I need from you. He says, if God blesses you too much, you're going to get away from him and figure and forget who blessed you. So he says, this is what I'm going to implement into the strategy to make sure that you don't forget the one who blessed you. Do you hear me in Florida? I'm talking to you. 
New York, I'm talking to you. He says, this is what I need you to do. He says, after every meal, I need you to praise God. Every time you feel him being good, I need you to worship him. That's verse 10. He says, after every meal, you've got to promise me that you won't forget to praise him. And then he says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 14. He says, when you praise him, he says, God is going to first in the autumn send you what he calls early rain. Just sprinkles of blessings. It's a, a $10,000 check to help you get through and then it might dry up for a while. It's, just, it's an influx of business for a few months and then it may stop. Just early rain. He says, but by the time the spring gets here, I'm going to take you into a season that I call latter rain. And latter rain is when it comes from up high so much that you're walking knee deep in it down low. What are you going to do when you're drowning in blessings? No more dry places. No more moths and rust. No more aches and pains. And for us, how do our clothes not wear out? We got enough money to go get some more. I speak that God's going to bless your shopping ministry. Hey, won't he do it? That's that, that's that shopping ministry rock. Won't he do it? Don't let nobody think you that God doesn't want you to be blessed. I mean, it's, it's a farce. It's a fallacy. Why would God want his children looking broke? You make him look bad. Touch your name and say, I look fly. I look good. <laughs> trying to hold it back. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it together. Touch my. I'm about to give you a practical revelation nobody tells you in the church. God is about to bless you because he wants you to have what you want. The Bible says, I will give you the desires of your heart. Stop letting people make you think that you sinning because you got more than two pair of shoes. I pray God bless your shoe ministry. Somebody say more J's, more, more heels, Lord, more, more red bottoms in Jesus' name, more, more Valentino, more, more Fendi, more, 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 more. God's going to bless your purse ministry. Somebody shout, I'm about to get the bag. And then another one, and then another one, and then another one. No, because God wants, he's, everything ain't spiritual. He wants you to have stuff. So you will know where the stuff came from. He doesn't want you to worship the stuff. He gives you the stuff so you can go back to the source and worship him. Fellas, God's going to bless your watch ministry. 
I'm gonna talk y'all language now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. All that purses and all that fellas like when it's gonna be our turn. God's about to bless your portfolio ministry. You'll never get a car repossessed because you won't have no payments. I pray that every man is going to be able to send all of their children to college on your dime if they don't get a scholarship. Throw a couple belts in there too, God. Give me a, a couple belts and yeah, just a couple. I mean, we don't need a whole lot, you know what I mean? Just about 10, 15, 20, 30, something like that. Bless my savings account. Bless my retirement. Bless, bless my investment. Let my house appreciate and value. And God says, okay, now that I have you excited, I'm giving you none of that. But I will give you an idea so you can do it for yourself. <laughs> you get it? Okay. He's going to give you an idea to go get all of that yourself. But let me tell you something. Do you hear me? This is not the season for you to be lazy. I need you to go and get in somebody's gym and work out so you can get your second wind. I need you to do some mental exercises so you won't be frustrated. Because I know some of y'all like, uh, Rev, can we do this other than a treadmill? Yes, you can at least be psychologically healthy too. Whatever, what I'm trying to tell you is I need you to do, because he's going to give you the idea. God never gives us chairs. He gives us trees. See, God bless me with furniture. Okay, here's a tree. Make some furniture out of it. Okay, you ask God for a tree. God will give you an acorn. Are you going to have faith? Because if you wait... That acorn becomes an oak tree and you can carve anything out of it you want he gives you the materials you have to bring the substance I need every person who wants to own your own business to stand up every person who has an idea to stand up every person who who you know God can use you to do different things a talent a gift I need you to stand up because I'm about to ask God to bless the thing he gave you I don't need to be anybody else to get what I'm about to get. All I know is I'm going to look up and say, how in the world? How did I get to Canaan? I was just in the wilderness. How did I get to the place where I have no debt? How did I? How did I get? Where am I? When is it going to end? When is it going to all fall apart? When am I going to self-sabotage? When are you going to let somebody come and steal it? I won't enjoy it because I'll be too afraid I'm going to lose it. Never. It will never end. Lift your hands. Just what he said he would do. He's gonna fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's
Somebody said, don't give up, sing it in your key, cause he won't give up on you. Don't give up on God, he won't give up on you. Everybody say, he's able. Come on and hug somebody, come on and hug somebody, tell him he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able. He's able from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. He's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able. Don't you give up. Don't you give up. 